welcome to the Florida Man 40K Podcast. I don't know if I was supposed to intro this show, but my name is Jimmy Prescott. Here with me, I've got Leno, the man with the beard, Leno, and Dan, the man also with a beard, Dan. Thank you very much. That was Jimmy, also has a beard, Prescott. Yeah, how are you guys doing? Yeah, doing uh, good. We all have beards. Yeah. Yes, so we're doing great. So all, you, all you beardless fools aren't doing as well as we are. Mm. That's not true at all. That was sad and offensive. <laughs> so, you guys had a lot more exciting week in the world of Warhammer in this past week than I. You guys, were we starting with that? Should we start with something different? Um, I think what we're going for with this episode, uh, we're breaking down a couple different topics today. So what we're going to talk about is how to kill the new Space Marines. All right. Um, then we'll go over a little five-minute meta. Then uh, we're going to talk about a tournament that was held this past weekend that Daniel and I both attended, and we're specifically going to break down how Daniel did with orcs and kind of give his um, thoughts and feedback on the list because he's very new to playing orcs. And then I think we're going to cap everything off by talking about the Nova Invitational. Um, they released the bracket earlier today, including what factions everyone will be playing. So I'm going to break down, you know what everyone's bringing, who I'm playing against. We'll talk a little bit about that, our reactions, who we thought was snubbed, and I think we'll work from there. All right. Cool. Sounds good. All right. So first things first, everyone and their mother, and the milkman who's visiting their mother, is talking about Space Marines right now. Um, we don't, none of us are Space Marine players by habit. Uh, we're probably all going to be Space Marines in the next week. But until that point, we are not any different than any other podcast, so we're going to talk instead about how to kill them. Because if there's one thing I hate more than Space Marines, it's them still being alive. Yeah, pretty much. I hate Space Marine players. That's not true, but uh, specifically Cass talking about playing his fluff list, and it's not fluffy, it's competitive. Yeah, so. Space Marines are no longer, well, I mean, they can be fluffy, but they're no longer just sad boys that you make fun of. They're no longer just the one thirteen year old who bought a starter box. Everyone's on Space Marines now because they are so, so good. But kind of after breaking down the codex I've got in my hands, looked at the supplements, I don't think they're as maybe as terrifying as I thought once I actually ran some points and tried to write a list with all the things that terrified me. Turns out that was 3,000 points. So maybe they're not as bad as we thought, but still they're going to be a force in the meta, so we all need to kind of have a plan on how we're going to kill them. Um, starting things off, I think that we can pretty safely say that the Tactical Marine is dead. We're probably going to see almost every Space Marine list have at least a battalion, and that's almost certainly going to include Primaris troops. Um, we all know how to kill scouts already, and there's nothing new there, but you're probably going to want to have tools to kill Primaris troops, and I can also see a lot of the multi-wound um, units like Aggressors and Centurions coming back. And then I think Space Marines are going to be seeing a lot of characters and vehicles as well. Yeah. So, uh, to dive right in, what that means is we've got to have uh, multi-damage and some high strength and some high volume of, like, middling strength. So, to me, that naturally progresses to uh, Tau and Imperial Knights and Chaos Knights. Uh, they just tend to have those tools. I'm not saying that they're the hard counter, but at first glance they have the obvious tools that just can kill Marines. Would you guys agree? Definitely agree. Um, I think that the meta is... I think people are still catching on to Chaos Knights and haven't... Most people haven't figured it out yet. We'll actually talk more about that in a little bit. I think Chaos Knights will become stronger with the increase of... With the influx of Space Marines in the meta. I think normal Imperial Knights will actually go up in stock a little bit. Uh, Tau have kind of been steadily on the rise for a couple months. I don't see that changing. Um, when you look at Team Eldar... Um, I think you can start to make cases for, first of all, with the Raven Guard uh, changes, we're kind of assuming that Elytox is going to get the nerf stick in a minute. Um, I think that you can make a case for a couple of Eldar units that maybe have been popular but have dropped off. Um, I think Bike Autarchs are going to come in in a big way, because when they've got the Laser Lances, that's a boatload of attacks at Strength 4 AP 2. That is very, very good at killing, a, killing Primaris troops, and you can get them higher strength on that. You can get them a lot of extra attacks through a couple different means. Mm -hmm. um, I think those will be very powerful. Um, I could see Shining Spears making a small comeback, just having one squad that you hide in the back and then run out and kill a screening unit. Um, Dark Reapers, 
Again, AP2, damage 2, strength 5 is well suited to kill tactical marines. And then space marines actually have a lot of negatives to hit. I could see um, I could see Eldar builds going back to a more traditional, like maybe year and a half ago style, where spears and reapers make a resurgence, but instead of being Yanari, I mean, you could still be Yanari, but maybe instead of that, you're looking at adding in a couple more gun units like Ravagers. Again, great anti-marine units. Um, and you probably still keep a couple flyers in there, I would think. Yeah, I think uh, the more balanced Eldar lists do have a lot of potential. Uh, like three Crimson Hunter Exarchs, or um, depending on how you want to get I also like the Razorwing Jet Fighters, because they do have the kind of toolkit and variable style shots. Um, what I would say uh, is Dark Reapers are more expensive. We mm -hmm. can't deny that. But ignoring modifiers to hit and damage two is uh, just good against Plague Bearers, which are phasing out of the meta because of the Marines, in my opinion, and the potential nerfs coming. But uh, anyway, so they're good against that, which is a very popular unit. And then if you add that they kill Intercessors, they kill Raven Guard, um, Marines, Scouts, pretty much any one or two wound model, they just they are good at just picking up and then fire fading back into a building. Um, it takes a little more finesse because they are glass jawed, but good Eldar players were winning with them before, they can win with them again, and if they're suited to take out two of the top dogs in the meta, then, I mean, if you beat, like, what is it, beat the best and outplay the rest, like, that's what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see them coming back. Um, I really, just, honestly, I really like the Autarchs bouncing around. Um, I got to see Carter Lee choose those a couple weeks ago. I was very impressed by them. Uh, I absolutely could see those becoming a staple in Eldar list just because of, I mean, how efficient that is at killing Marines and how annoying those units were. Well, it's like the uh, that Destroyer Lord we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. uh, a couple episodes ago. The ability to fly past screens and assassinate buffing characters is an incredibly powerful tool that most people aren't prepared for. You think about a Vindicare assassin, you know what he's going to do. You know, stay out of line of sight, do this, do that, have little, like, grot oilers to dump to, or shield drones, or... There's, there's ways to get around it, and sometimes it just rolls that one to wound, or it rolls a one or a two to do the mortal wounds and it doesn't kill the characters quickly. If you have characters that can assassinate enemy characters and just get there efficiently, you, even if you lose double the points in your models to take out that buffing character, the efficiency in the force multiplier goes way down and it's advantage you. Because again, it's not all about the points trade, it's about the actual game state and how do you affect the game state. So I can absolutely see Autarchs being used in a positive trade to uh, swing the game state in your favor. Yep. I would definitely trade a, an Autark to kill uh, like the minus one to hit Plague Caster, whatever the, the Nurgle Herald. Poxbringer. Poxbringer. Definitely would do that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Jimmy, you currently looking into Tau. Um, obviously, um, the Riptide, I think, is pretty good at killing Marines. Um, from what I'm seeing from Marines, a lot of their anti-infantry options went up a lot. Uh, their anti-vehicle, I think, is about the same as before, but without the Goleman rerolls, meaning the big toughness 8, toughness 7, 2-up save, 3-up save, those large targets, I think, can survive against Marine shooting. They've got much better melee, but if you can get a couple turns of shooting before they get to melee, I think you've got some strengths there. Um, anything you're seeing from Marine so far that you think a Tau might do well, things that you're scared of, what do you think? How are you going to kill Marines? I think there's a... A good play there for Marines in the first turn of just removing all of the drones because yep. they have so much low impact fire, it can take out those you know weaker drones in the beginning. So by turn two, you're probably just going to be dealing with those vehicles and it kind of becomes that war of attrition where they don't have necessarily the tools to remove them right away, but all that firepower is now concentrated. So the good news is as a Tau player, you should be able to last through the first turn if you're playing a high drone suit list, but you really need to make that mark in that first turn, or their mm -hmm. sheer firepower should still be able to do work against your remaining units. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would add on to that. Um, the, with Tau, it's always been about target priority, making sure, because you only eliminate one to two threats a turn usually, so it's making sure you are perfect with your target priority against the Marines, because... They will remove your screen, your drones quickly, but if you can take out the things that will kill 
riptides quickly. I mean, you don't... A riptide could take probably 200 strength force shots and not get killed. So if you can get rid of all of the threats early on, then you can win that battle of attrition. So it's going to be a matter of knowing your opponent and knowing what Marines do to be able to, to win that game with Tau. But I do think it stays a very winnable game. Yeah. Just don't don't panic and tilt when you're out of drones and they haven't even finished their first shooting phase. Yeah. So I think Tau is going to be in a nice place, which makes me feel like I, I did a nice roll of the dice there in the army choice because here's a little story I don't know if I've shared on the podcast before, but I started with Tyranids right before 2018 Adepticon, I believe it was. So the big game was to, you know, you had uh, Gene Steelers as your troops, but you just ran a ton of Hive Tyrants with wings before they had a limit of three, and then you would just deep strike them all in. So after that, they had the limit of three, the points nerf that brought them up by like 80 points or so. It was only like 20, but still it, it was it enough. It felt bad. It felt <laughs> bad. And then right after... Uh, at the same time, they introduced the beta rules for deep striking, which made it to where you couldn't deep strike until your second turn unless it was in your own deployment zone. So, like, all of a sudden, Tyranids went from, like, pretty good to performing well at one event and being completely wiped off the table. And Tyranids have not been good since then. So I had spent probably about 1200 to $2,000 on a Tyranids army, and then it was just like, nope, no more of that. So after that, I was like... I guess I'm just going to buy every army, and then at some point I'll pull it out of the closet and it'll be good. So I was feeling like not having invested in Marines yet was a bad play, because it's like I've got Tyranids, i got Knights, i got Chaos, i got Tau. And now all of them are going to suck ass against, uh, <laughs> against uh, the Space Marines. But, you know, Tau might be in a good place. I think uh, Tau and um, Knights will do very well. Um... I'm a little worried about like the Jim Vessel list into Marines. I think that Marines with their full rerolls um, will get around the negatives a lot more efficiently than most armies, and I think they can kill the Plague Bears fast enough. Um, but I'm sure he'll adapt to that. But I think Knights and Tau can do very well into Marines. Tyranids are unfortunately in a rough place right now, but that doesn't mean that they're dead in the water. Um, I think what you're looking at with Tyranids is they're probably not really being taken as a pure army, unfortunately. I think that they are relegated to being a, an ally to Gene Stiller Cult. But with that in mind, um, the list style that I've been running right now has been pretty much no shooting other than like some hand flamers. And it's been all about getting into melee and just charging people out of deep strike and wrapping screens, killing screens, and just getting into the core there. Space Marines, if they choose to go that direction, and it's a little too soon for a meta list to have emerged, Space Marines could definitely pose a really big threat there because they've got great overwatch for multiple units. Um, they've got incredible weight of anti infantry fire, so you have to get a wrap off. If you're getting shot by them, you are losing tons of models. And they've got really effective flying screens and anti deep strike screens between infiltrators with their 12 inch no zone and the, uh, the impulser, which is the, uh, the flying rhino that, with minus two to charge. I think that adding some Tyranid allies as like a ground force would actually be very efficient there. Um, minus two to charge is great, but if you just, for example, had a unit of Gene Stirs on the board and the Swarm Lord sends them up and you get two inches away, a two inch charge to a four inch charge is something I can live with personally. I'm still pretty confident I can make that charge. Same thing, infiltrators, um, they have no defense against just walking up to them and hitting them. So if you do that, then, I mean, there you go. Um, if you just sent a unit of Gene Stirs again, they can go. I think 34 inches as of recent FAQs across the board to go hit a screen. They could be very useful there. Uh, that and Hive Guard. Um, Hive Guard, Strength 8, minus 2 damage, D3. Ignore line of sight if you can get them into a good position, which unfortunately does rely a little bit on having some good terrain. They are pretty efficient at shooting the Impulsor. Um, T or Strength 8 versus T7 is in your favor, certainly. And then Strength 8 versus T4, they're good against Marines. So I could see people taking, going maybe half and half detachment where you're looking at one battalion of Tyranids with like Swarm Lord, some Gene Stealers, and a six Hive Guard. Uh, that's probably a little over a thousand. Then you take a cheap trash bat of Gene Stealer Cult and then a heavy hitting tra uh, battalion of Gene Stealer Cult with like probably either Acolytes or Aberrants at that point. Probably I would do Aberrants personally, but you could certainly go the other way. I think that would be the scenario where we're seeing... Uh, we're seeing Tyranids. With that in mind, um, on Space Marines don't have a lot of indirect fire. 
and there's such emphasis on keeping them pure that I don't think that you'll see very often people take Space Marines with Basilisks or Scorpius, but they do have the Thunderfire Cannon with its here I'm going to half your movement, so I think you're probably looking at taking two genes to their squads at that point, or you're committing to having Vect in there, where you say, okay, they're going to try to do this on turn one, I'm going to Vect that, so that even if I go second, I will still get the Gene Stealers in, however many are alive, into combat rather than having all of their movement, at which point you're screwed. Right. So, I don't think Tyranids are pure yet, but if Space Marines, specifically that build, does become prevalent, then I think Gene Stealer Cult will explore them as allies and seeing what they want to add. Maybe you just do a cheap battalion of just uh, Termagants, Broodlords, or Neurothropes, and one Hive Guard squad. Uh, or biovores, but I think having indirect fire to shelter from the marine firepower will be very valuable, and the ability to pop those transports uh, and those screening units will be very important for Gene Slur Cult, so that kind of gives Tyranids a role that Gene Slur Cult doesn't do very well. Yeah. Well, I'm excited for that. Yeah. Uh, we'll see what Space Marines actually becomes popular, because it, it might be all Predators, for all I know, at which point Gene Slur Cult will need no help at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So... To transition to the uh, army that I hold near and dear to my heart, and I think will do well, is uh, Chaos Knights. I like Chaos in general, but so Chaos Knights have, uh, despoilers have high volume of strength 6, AP 2, damage 2 from the double Gatling cannons. Uh, Castigator, which is not talked about enough in my opinion, has uh, 16 strength 6, AP 2, damage 2 shots from its single gun. And it has, uh, its sword is, you make two attacks instead of one, and it's, um, I want to say it's strength 12, AP 3, damage 3. Uh, so damage 3 is great for killing aggressors, which we're going to see a lot, and damage 2 obviously is great against Primaris Marines. Um, and I personally really like Infernal, and in that detachment I also like the Armager Helverin, the War Dog. Uh, because it's a damage 3 weapon base. So, it takes a little bit of luck with the Armager, because it's only AP 1. But, uh, actually there might be a way to make it AP 2, I'd have to look in. I think it's wound rolls of 6 on a Relic, so it's not reliable. But anyways, uh, you can get, with Infernal, the Armager to damage 4, which will kill a Centurion each failed save. Uh, the... Uh, Castigator is going to be damage 3 for days from between Infernal and Melee, so that's great against the Aggressors and things of that level. And of course it's Strength 7 at that point, which doesn't matter into Aggressors, but it's helpful into Impulsors and other T7 vehicles. Wounding on 4s instead of 5s is a big deal. Uh, and then your Double Gaddy Knight is Strength 6, AP 2, damage 2. Uh, you can give it the Ignores uh, modifiers to hit Relic if you need to depending on the flavor of marine you're fighting. And you can get one of those guns to 7 AP2 damage 3. So you just have a high volume of high toughness wounds that put out a medium volume, high strength, good AP, good damage shots. And in that style list, you can also fit like three Lord Discordants and a Red Corsair's Battalion. So now you have a ton of command points. You have a ton of threats that just get across the table. Uh, you can do some shenanigans with Dreadblade and stuff like that. I'm not going to go into all of the details. But essentially, you can be incredibly fast and incredibly efficient at killing Marines. And at the same time, because you're Toughness 8, even your Armager can be Toughness 8 if you don't need the damage boost. Um, that will allow you to survive a lot of Strength 4 shooting. Because who cares if they're rerolling the hits? They're not rerolling to wound with Gulliman anymore. That got changed. If you're toughness 8 and they're strength 4, like, great, you're wounding me on 6s. I don't care that much. I got a 3-up armor save. I'll survive. Um, so, I really like that. And if they're targeting the knights, they're not dealing with the discordance. We know how discordance do in melee. They just shred things. If they survive, they eat things. End of story. And then you have red corsairs to hide in uh, ruins, get hold objectives, whatever. And you have... I personally like the double Melta Warpsmith because he can kind of sneak up, pop vehicles with Melta, whatever. But that's just like an example of a list that I've been thinking about. It's, um, it's similar to some other meta lists. No one's really running the Castigator right now that I've seen. Uh, not an Infernal Castigator, anyways. I've seen some Imperial ones. But um, 
in my opinion, that's just a good way to get a lot of anti-marine shooting that is still good against other pieces of the meta. Because you're getting, you're still getting strength seven, strength eight shooting uh, that can deal with other vehicles, deal with riptides, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't really um, seen a lot out of the, the Forge World Knights yet. Um, I definitely think, I think Chaos Knights, they're. I feel like people didn't really know what to make of them, and maybe they were trying to play them like Imperial Knights right when they came out. Um, and we really didn't see them doing well in tournaments for a while. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk a little more about that later, but I think with the Marines, they're going to hit their stride. And, you know, people will be done scraping the transfers off their Imperial Knights and drilling holes to stick spikes in. And I think <laughs> we're going we're gonna to start seeing Chaos Knights a lot more with the Marine book. So the good thing about that is I started out just by making my Knights Chaos Knights and just playing them as Imperial Knights. So, so I, got, I got a head start. <laughs> so now you're back. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, what other armies... So we said Eldar uh, has potential. Their current mm -hmm. builds aren't necessarily great, but there's potential builds that would be good. Uh, Tau have good opportunity. Um, the uh, Chaos Knights, obviously. I just said that. Mm -hmm. um, Gene Stiller Cult will have play. They always have some type They've of They've always tricks. got some play, but it's going to be hard. Yeah, it's going to take lie. Yeah, a lot of playtesting, a lot of failure to figure out the <laughs> right way to, to handle the different lists. Yeah. Um, Necrons are Necrons. They kind of kill. They don't really care that much what they're fighting against. They kill it all about the same. Like They do some mortal mm -hmm. wounds. They got some decent AP. I actually love Destroyers at AP3, rerolling all hits and wounds. That makes them... I think very efficient, but they just have trouble surviving the counter punch. So you have to be really cagey. You you have fly and you're fast, so uh, destroyers have some play, but you will lose them. It's just a matter of when. Yeah. And did you make it worth it? So if you use destroyers to trade up, I think they do very well in a marine style meta. I think every army has tools against um, space marines, and they're just not taking them right now because they haven't had to. I expect we'll see. Post Nova, probably a solid month or two of Space Marines doing very well. Like, I'm sure SoCal Open, I think we'll see a ton of Space Marines representing very well. Um, I think Harvester of Souls is in mid September. Uh, there's a couple other big ones. Uh, the London GT. I don't know if, actually, I'm not sure if they're using the Space Marine Codex now that I think about it. But I think we'll, we'll see a lot of September, October victories from Space Marines. And then I think they'll kind of taper off as people just start bringing to beat them. Um, even imp like Imperial Guard, you can take plenty of high AP shooting. Uh, plasma Scions, Plasma Lycians, start throwing Plasma Cannons on the sponsors of all your tank commanders. Take Plasma Cannons on your tank commanders. Basically, Plasma is really good against Marines. Um, it'll kind of be weird to see where the meta goes. I personally am thinking that Vehicle Heavy is going to be the way to go, just because a lot of the things that make infantry good are stratagem based. And once you start writing the list, it's very difficult to get enough command points in while staying pure space marines. So I expect to see the buffed vehicles and characters making heavy appearances with maybe like a couple intercessor squads with Thunder Hammers. Uh, that would be my prediction. Other than that, um, we've... I think that hits just about all the bases. Um, Imperium, right now they're kind of riding the Caladius. Um, and you know what? As long as the Caladius is good, uh, there's no reason not to. Um, I think that the Claytis will do just fine into Marines. Most of the Marine vehicles are Toughness 7. At worst, they're Toughness 8. You can get one Toughness out of the spell. That one would be annoying, but, you know, even a Leviathan isn't killing all of the Custodes by itself, so having that really good, reliable, high-strength fire, I think will just do very well into Marines. Yeah, definitely. So with that, do we want to go ahead and roll on into our five-minute meta? That's the least dramatic introduction I've ever heard. Well, I was waiting Jimmy? for you guys to, like, kick it up. And five minute meta! Five minute meta. Yeah. All right, guys. So, here we are. Uh, five minute meta. We're going to go over Matthew Ali's list from this past weekend. Uh, he actually got first place at War Games Con. And Matthew has been sitting, um, I think, kind of in that, like, 10 to 20 spot for a couple months now. But that actually boosted him in the ITC ranking significantly. I think he just jumped into into the top five. So definitely he's been having a very good season so far. No one should be surprised to see him win a tournament in Texas if they've been paying attention to it. But the list he did it with is kind of interesting. I'm going to go ahead and read the list, and then I'm going to have Daniel take over, because he is definitely our chaos expert. 
So Matt brought Chaos Knights, and this is the first time I've personally seen them win a G-tier major. He had three despoilers, which are the kind of build a bear knights, and all of them had three thermal can or had two thermal cannons on both of their arms, so six thermal cannons they total. They had three thermal cannons. It's, it's, it's legal. Just yeah, ask I, Stephen Pampreen. Oh, we're throwing shade now. Okay. I always throw shade. <laughs> okay, so three knights, six thermal cannons total. They are the iconic class household, and two of them are dreadblades, and I believe the warlord is one of those dreadblades. Um, then the list is a battalion of uh, Flawless Toast, it's a Soul Forge pack, and you're looking at three Lord Discordants and three units of ten cultists. Finally, there is an auxiliary of Armin on the disc, just for little psychic. Daniel, go. Alright, so uh, I'm going to start off by correcting Lennon because it's my favorite thing to do. Uh, the Warlord is not a Dreadblade, it's the other two. Oh, um, never mind. So, but that's not a big deal. Um, anyways, so... To go into a little bit of tech, the Build-A-Bear Warlord is, um, he's got the Knight Diabolus Warlord trait, which is plus one attack, and he is, um, the, he has the Veil of Medrengard, which is the 4-up and Vulnerable save. So, as Iconoclast, you get plus one attack, plus one AP, basically first round of combat. Charge, receive a charge, heroic intervention, blah, 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 blah. So... Uh, Iconoclast also has, for every 10 models you kill as a stratagem, uh, you choose a knight, every 10 models that it kills, you get an additional attack. So what he has done is he has built a list with six major assets who are flying across the table. Um, the Iconoclast knights have the thermal cannons. They're not the primary damage dealing. They're actually there as a supplement. The whole goal is you move all six models across the table as quick as you can while still holding objectives, playing table control, uh, and you just stomp. You get um, so your your primary knight has five attacks uh, base, so it goes to fifteen stomps. If it's killed ten models, which he probably used the stratagem on that one, if I had to guess, because it's got the four up and vulnerable save base, but he might spread it out. It's hard to say. Uh, just probably depends on games and how quickly and efficiently his opponent should be able to kill a knight. He probably spreads it out or doesn't based on those matchups. But uh, to, to slow down a little bit, I guess, um, one Dreadblade can take the Dreadblade Relic, which lets it take one Pact and one Damnation, as well as get a 5-up and Vulnerable save in melee in addition to at range. You can't rotate in melee, but you can at range, so that's fine. I think you actually... It specifically says, oh, it says on the can. Chaos Stratagem you can. Oh, uh, okay. Um, Imperium can. Yeah, unless it's an epic. Shouldn't have betrayed seen. the Emperor, fool. Well, we got Infernal and Iconoclast, which is better. Fine. Um, anyways, so what I would do, because I, I don't... He doesn't have it all detailed in the list, but you use that, that relic, which you buy for one command point, and you take the... Uh, Pact that gives you either plus two inch movement or plus one weapon skill or plus one ballistic skill based on a die roll. And you take the one damnation of uh, in a phase where you've taken a wound on a four plus, at the end of the phase you take an additional wound. It's a very low uh, drawback to a very high ceiling because the faster these knights are moving, the faster they're getting into combat and they're keeping up with the Lord Discordance. So. Uh, again, basically you throw everything forward at once. You have Armin because he's your best warp time. He's on a disc, so he's fast. 12-inch movement, he's keeping up. When you move in advance your uh, your Lord Discordance, you can still move advance Armin, get that warp time off, get a turn one charge, and have knights all bearing down. So you have to deal with that Discordant that's in your line turn one. If you're dealing with that Discordant, you're not killing the knights that are about to crash into your line turn two. And if you're dealing with the knights, it, it's that constant threat saturation, daring your opponent. Daring your opponent. So basically, it's just a uh, constant threat saturation, daring your opponent to kill everything efficiently enough. Whatever they don't kill is going to get into their lines. Knights are really good because they get in, obviously, you know, they stomp on screens, whatever. You can't really tag them in melee to hold them back because they fall back over you. So they're forcing 
what they don't kill has to fall back away from them. And they're actually developing a lot of board control uh, in doing that. So it looks like it's just a go ahead and kill everything list, but you're actually sneaking up and getting a lot more board control than you would think, because who's going to try to kill cultists or Aramin when you have all these big threats? And you can make a bunch of them characters, so it's good for Crucible of Champions and, and stuff like that. Uh, you can score recon very efficiently because everything's so fast. You can potentially do ground control. It's risky because you have a low number of units. But you can just, at the end of the game, decide, oh, I can just go cover the entire board and grab all these objectives. If you're going second, you can uh, basically know if I go kill everything off that objective, I'm going to get hold more. So what, at first glance, looks like I'm just going to go punch you in the face and you're going to die, it actually has a lot more play for board control. And I think that's how that list really functions, is it intimidates your opponent into castling up it crashes into the castle and it just keeps throwing bodies into it. But at the same time, while you're distracted there, they're actually raking up points on objectives. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, honestly, like if I saw that list, I think most armies I play would be in the corner behind the screen, you know, holding on for your dear life, hoping I don't get touched by all of it at once. Because, you know, those, those Chaos Knights are just brutal and melee. Discordant Lords are still Discordant Lords. Which um, actually got a minor buff yes, after this event. I just after like this event. I like to slip that in. They did get the extra attack as well. Because so. why not? How'd they get an extra attack? Because uh, they're heretic of star days. Yeah, all of the new the new space marine rule to give plus one attack on the charge. They FAQ'd that into all of the codexes and um, the cast space marine codex as well. So Death Guard, Thousand Suns, cast space marines, Blood Angels, all of them. They all got that ability as well. Dang. So even vehicles, pretty much everything but like Zangors, cultists, servitors, like the not actually space marine units, all of those got the extra buff. So even demon princes, uh, the chaos space marine demon princes get an extra attack now because because why not? Why Just not? Charge. Yeah, didn't... it's charged or being charged or heroically intervening. So almost the, every round. Yeah, the first round, the first combat phase that they're engaged in. Each time uh, they re-engage. Yeah, and each time they re-engage. Although, if you get charged by someone and you're just sitting in combat, or if you charge someone and you just sit in combat for the full turn, you can then just heroically intervene half an inch, even though you're already in combat, and then boom, extra attack. Yeah. So base every single Space Marine model in a unit, otherwise they'll keep getting yeah. you know, plus one attack if they have a way to heroically intervene. Yep. Hmm. Which there is a way. Which there is a way. Which in the Marine Codex. In the Marine Codex. Ultramarine specifically. Yeah. For infantry and bikers only, <laughs> though, not, not vehicles. That. That's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. If, you, if you've got a... Sorry, tangent here. If you've got a 10-man Intercessor squad, um, two attacks each, you can go plus one attack for charging, plus one attack for veteran Intercessors, plus one attack for being nearby a banner. Um, and I think there's one more, but we're going to limit it at just the five attacks right now. If you leave one guy trailing back, still close enough to swing, just not touching the enemy. Within That's, an inch of an inch is pretty easy yeah, to yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, pretty easy to do. Um, then you just have your Warlord within six inches, and that one guy just heroically intervenes a little bit closer if they don't fall back, and if no one charges them, and then boom, plus one attack. Yeah. So to, is it to the entire unit? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. for the, one. The, bottle. <laughs> as long as the one guy's just doing his little dance in the back, they're all getting plus on attack. That's so good, and it, obviously you're going to be killing stuff. So then, like other things are getting pulled out of melee, and then yep. you just keep that. And then you just going. keep on charging. Marines are pretty pretty silly. That that's great. unless they get shot to death first, which is why I love Chaos Knights. Yeah, there you go. All right, so um, I think we're speaking. Of, well, not speaking of Chaos Knights. Um, bouncing back to the other army you play, orcs. Yes. Um, this past weekend, uh, Daniel and I went to a art, an RTT at Cosm Comics Kissimmee. Yep. Unfortunately, um, it was hoping to be a GT, didn't quite get the numbers. I think we ended like two people short, but we still played five rounds. And uh, Daniel, why didn't you tell us uh, how you felt? All right, so yeah, I'll take over again. Um, basically, I decided I wanted to play Orcs, but I had no idea what to play. So what I did is I just decided that I was going to take literally every unit I wanted to play test, throw it in a list, uh, put a bunch of uh, Gretchen down for bubble wrap, and see what happened. And I went 3-0 day one. <laughs> so uh, more or less, what I found out with orcs 
is they're a board control army that sometimes accidentally removes about a thousand points of your opponent in one or two turns. Um, and what I mean by that is you, you're relying a lot on a couple rolls to go well for you with Ludas or with the Shock Attack mech or even the Tank Busters. Like you have to know when to invest in them to get the maximum return. So it really, your order of operations matters a lot. Uh, with Ludas, you have to declare your target and then roll the D3. With the Shock Attack mech, you roll your strength first, then you declare your target, then you roll the number of shots. Like, it's it's kind of all over the place. Um, but once you kind of get a grasp on how everything works and functions together, um, they're, I, I see why they've been doing so well. They're incredibly good at a lot of things. Now, the biggest mistakes that I made, because day two, we did a, a cut top four play day two, and I was going in at third place. And uh, my game four, I just made a bad call. I got a bunch of damage through with my shock attack mech on an Orion, and I did, I think, like 15 or 16 damage. So I used my Death Skulls reroll and got that to, like, 18 so I spent my reroll for the shooting phase to try to get that last damage through and kill the Orion. That came back to bite me because then my shock attack mech, I shot with him twice because I'd used more DACA, so usually that's when I choose to dedicate. If I do more DACA, I'm going to go all in on that unit. So I got the Orion one wound left with the reroll, and then I rolled like strength 10 on the shock attack gun. And I rolled snake eyes on the number of shots. So essentially, I spent those additional two command points for nothing. If I would have saved my reroll for the number of shots, there's a chance I could have increased that efficiency, gotten to, even I got to four or five shots with more DACA, that can turn into three hits actually kind of quickly. Uh, again, with the Death Skulls, because it's a new shooting attack, you get another reroll, you get everything. So it's where... I tried to go big, I needed to hold back and just play more efficient. And that's the thing with orcs, is you feel like they're going to be swingy, and you feel like you have to dedicate and make this big push when you do it. But really, what I learned is you've got to be very particular with your resource management because you have to have certain things go your way to stay consistent. Um, so I, I took that approach into my game five, which was against Will with his Tau. And that game just did not go my way. Um, he played it incredibly well. I made a couple mistakes. Um, and basically, so the, the list did what I wanted it to because I learned what worked, what didn't, how to use certain units. Uh, I know um, a lot of people have, have said that they don't like Tank Bustas and Ludas in the same list. It's one or the other because they both want the same resources. What I like, and it's because of my Chaos background, I use Tank Bustas more like a throwaway unit like Obliterators. You drop them in, you use that one turn to go as efficient as you can, uh, so I take the uh, Mordaka against vehicles that are rerolling to hit, I spend the two command points for reroll to wound, so I'm spending four command points on this unit. But this, this unit size was 15, I'll probably drop it to 10. But 15 shots, hitting on fives, rerolling, getting extra attacks on fives, and rerolling those, I would consistently get about like 12 to 15 hits from a unit of 15 bullet skill 5 models with a single shot each. Then you're wounding uh, a ton of stuff on 3s, even knights you're wounding on 4s, re-rolling, so you're getting like 75-80% wound efficiency. AP2 damage flat 3. Damage flat 3 is one of my favorite things in the entire game. So I just drop down, I remove... I, the, the goal, if, you, if you're playing safe, you just put all the shots into one asset and just remove that asset from the table. If you're playing a little risky, you can try to split fire 8 and 7. With uh, Death Skulls, you do get one reroll, so it's kind of like having 8 shots and each going into two targets. That's good into things like tank commanders that don't have an invulnerable save. Well, I guess it puts them to 5 up anyway. But basically, medium to low armor stuff, you can do that too and be pretty efficient. Um, things like Tau Piranhas or Hammerheads, uh, stuff like that. So I really like just dropping them in, removing assets, and then, well, now you have to deal with them, which is just less anti-infantry that's going into my Ludas or going into uh, Orc Boys, stuff like that. So uh, basically, in summary, 
Mega knobs are not good with all the Gravatic backwash and uh, grab drones from Tau and tangle foot grenades and there's just enough stuff to negate their deep strike and charge and then they only move five inches as evil suns. Like, they're not fast enough. They don't have an invulnerable save. If you want to babysit them with a custom force field, you're just investing more and more points into a low model count army or into a low model count unit and a high model count army. So for me, that doesn't fit my play style and what I want to do. So they're coming out of the list. But what I did confirm and what I really like is I was able to make the Ludas and Tank Busters work together in tandem to have two massive assets that my opponent has to deal with. So that's kind of the positive I got out of it. And I got fourth place in a not GT. So that was cool. It was cool to see that it was successful as I was playtesting. So I enjoyed that. So real quick, um, obviously you're probably going to be dropping the Mega Nubs soon. Um, you had a couple Mech Guns in the list, as I recall. Yeah, I had three. And with Mech Guns, it's minimum six or zero. Like, okay. three is not enough. Three is not enough. So do you think then, if you're looking at dropping... Pardon me, the Mega Knobs, what are you thinking of putting in? Um, so I'll probably take my, uh, th I had three units of 10 Grots in the Bad Moons. I'm going to make those three units of 20, just more shields for the Ludas. And Grots are actually really good um, because nobody wants to waste time with them and they hold objectives. Um, and that's only 90 points of the, like, 300 I'm saving. So... Depends. I'll either go to six mic guns or I'll remove them. If I remove them, I might play around with putting like some flyers in the list just because I love uh, the DACA jets. Uh, otherwise, I'll be adding uh, probably a weird boy and then uh, upping. I had a unit of 10 uh, Choppa Sluggo boys that I was just going to add to the um, to mob up and, and go have fun. I'll probably just upgrade that back to a 30 man shooter boys squad because. Um, 60 boys really wasn't enough like I thought it would be but I'm, I'm spoiled by chaos infantry so definitely 90, 90 boys minimum adding 30 more grots and from there uh, oh also just weird boys are great I absolutely love uh, using their toolkit they've got decent buffing powers but then I just like steadily just move them forward move them forward and then I would just casually cast Smite with plus three to cast and, like, get a lot of, like, I have perils because that's how their rules work. But I also get a lot of just, like, D6 mortal wounds from them. So, for me, that's one thing I've always liked is having a little beehive where if things get too close, you can just lash out and do more damage that they're not expecting. And Weird Boys are incredibly good at that. So, I definitely want the third... Uh, plus, there's so many cool conversion options for Weird Boys specifically that I'm about doing that. So, if you're taking the Weird Boys, um, I don't think you had them in your list at the moment. Have you considered taking either Mad Dog Rotsnick or a Pain Boy? Um, not only for the feel of pain on any additional boys you had, but mostly to heal a Weird Boy so that he, he doesn't perils twice and then explode? Yeah. Um, I hadn't really thought about that. I could probably slip Grotznik in there pretty easily because, um, again, Mega Knobs are just so many points. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, healing the Weird Boys so I don't blow myself up would be incredibly useful. So I'll probably play around with that tech. That's one thing I love about the Orcs is they have... There's no, like, besides the Ludas, I guess, and even now they're not auto-take auto because in a vehicle-heavy meta, tank busters do just as much, if not more. So... Orcs have a ton of great options, very few things are auto-take, so you can just play around with it and really make them fit your play style, and that's what I like the most. I'm playing models that I like, I like what they do, I like their play style, and just in a small sample size I had some success and now I can tweak it and make it better and really have potential to have a lot more success with it. So they're a fun army, they have a lot of cool tools, and I'm excited to keep on uh, trying them out. I think for orcs, you're actually, you, you keep on trucking. Yeah. I believe is what we should do there. That was terrible. That you're was welcome. so good. So I'm, good, it's bad. I'm sad now. <laughs> I'm sorry to every, like, two orc players that listens. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just butchered it for all of you guys, and then you had to hear that joke at the end. You're welcome. That was so painful. <laughs> Those poor orc players. Oh, uh, yeah. You're a pain boy now? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Make it stop. <laughs> all right. So, um, only way to stop is to roll right into our next topic. Uh, so, the Nova Invitational, 
Um, they announced the bracket uh, earlier this morning, uh, this morning being Tuesday morning. And it's 16 man because they added an extra round to the open. So they cut around off the invitational to make up for it because they didn't want to have multiple days where people were playing four games in a day because that just is a little bit taxing. So I find myself in the ninth seed right around the middle. Um, it's actually a little higher than I was expecting. I was kind of expecting to be in that like 10 to 12. So I'm, I'm very happy with nine. Uh, my first round opponent will be Alex Fennell. He may be my last, but from everything that I've heard and seen on stream, uh, I've never met Alex personally, but Alex is the gentleman of 40k. Um, he's famous for the what would Alex do bracelets that go around from the moment in LVO that we all remember where Alex was a good sport when maybe someone else wasn't. Uh, so I'm really, really looking forward to that. Um, I know he's a tough competitor. He's been on the USA ETC team the past two years minimum, maybe um well, he was on it this year, actually. I don't know if he was on it before that, but he, he's a good player, and he's uh, has a reputation as being an excellent gentleman. So I'm really looking forward to that game. I think it should be fun. Um, you know, obviously I've now got a high standard to hold myself to, making sure that um, you know I'm I'm also being a good sport as I always try to be. Um, he's actually going to be playing Dark Elbar, Harlequins, and Craft World Elbar. I'm not going to dive too much into individual lists because they're not posted yet. Um, for the Invitational, all that we know is the factions being taken up by a player. So I'll tell you that I'm playing Adeptus Custodes, and that's all that I know right now. Um, I have not finalized the list. I just know that I wanted to play my Golden Boys because I've been building them and painting them for a while, and they've always been my fun army. And they've got plenty of tools to be competitive as well, so I certainly don't feel like I'm handicapping myself. But I really wanted a low model count army that... I could play for a day knowing that I've got three more days of gaming hardcore right after that with my Gene Stealer Cult. So I didn't want to do, you know, 11 consecutive games of Gene Stealer Cult in four days because that would probably kill my back. And I just think I'd fall asleep for about a week afterwards. So uh, the Custodes will be very fun. They're still very competitive. Um, I've got a couple different lists that I'm bouncing back and forth now, but all of them are low model count because it's Custodes. Um, I'm going to be trying out some bikes, trying out some guys on foot, trying out some of uh, those fun Forge World units, and we'll see where I go. Um, as to the actual bracket itself, I'm going to do a quick breakdown of what factions are present. And because I, I think that seeing the Nova Invitational specifically is always very interesting because this does not include the Space Marine Codex, but it really gives you a hint on what the best players in the game think the meta is right now. So you don't always see like the gatekeeper list at the Invitational. Uh, for example, uh, no one is taking Imperial Knights in the Invitational, um, which means maybe they're a strong army, but none of the people there think that they are an army to win the event. So what we're looking at as far as factions go, um, what's represented the most are Adeptus Custodes, Craft World Eldar, and Dark Eldar. All of those are represented four times. Um, it's four Eldar lists, and all four of them have Craft World Eldar and Dark Eldar. So no one thinks pure Eldar is as powerful as the combo. Um, obviously you want your ally talk and, uh, we're assuming ally talk, and your Vect access. So there's four Eldar lists out of 16 lists. Team Eldar has kind of gone down in stock a little bit um, overall, but I think they've got plenty of options still, and obviously people agree. Uh, four Adeptus Custodes, I'm willing to bet all four of those lists have uh, units from the Forge World beta rules. Uh, I think that's a pretty safe bet. Even if you're not taking the Kaladius tanks, you're probably taking the Terminators. But I expect it to be mostly Kaladius tanks. Again, that kind of raw firepower, Nova doesn't have magic boxes. They've got ruins, but um, Kaladius, with their speed, can potentially work around that. Obviously, they'll be very popular as well. Yeah, having those 60-inch flamers is pretty good. Yeah, 60-inch flamers, because they just always hit. I actually can roll ones with those, just for the record. I can roll plenty of ones. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> oh, I can do it, trust me. <laughs> um, we're looking at two, only two players are bringing Imperial Guard. Um, uh, people are starting to, you'll see later, um, there's two Admech players. People are bringing Admech as a supplement as well, not just Guard. I think people like Tank Commanders, but I'm guessing this is mostly because of the new Scorpius tank. Uh, those big L's, people try to hide in them. You need some ignore line of sight. I think tank commanders are not as good in Nova because they're not as fast when they're putting out their full damage output, whereas the Scorpius ignores line of sight. I'm guessing that's why a couple of top players made that switch. Um, one Blood Angels player for the Smash Captain, although that's allied in with Custodes and Guard. Uh, one Necron, um, Necrons by Alexander Ng, 
who is in the 16th seed. Um, it's kind of says what it does about Necrons, where they can absolutely compete. They made the Invitational, but they're maybe the bottom of that. Um, no disrespect to Alex, I don't know him at all, but it just amuses me that Necrons were the 16th seed when that's kind of how people perceive them right now. Yeah, but I will say, even with Lennon going, like I hope Lennon wins it and all that, but I would love to see the Necron player just go all the way and just win that thing with Necrons because it would just be hilarious. Because like, that's what they kind of do, is like they come in as underdogs, and they just kind of keep doing their thing, and sometimes you don't stop them. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I expect the best players in the ITC to be able to stop it, but there's always that little bit of a chance that they just kind of do the Necron thing, roll pretty well, and suddenly there Necrons are there. Yeah, I mean, even though they're the 16 seed, I would not be shocked if Necrons pulled the upset and um, beat number one, uh, who's Tony Cope back last year's winner. Mm -hmm. uh, I would not at all be surprised by that. Um, there's one Harlequin in there. Uh, there, That's going to be in Alex Fennel's list. Um, two people have demons, which there's a couple chaos lists, so I'm surprised to only see two demons attachments. Um, I think there were three chaos players, but only two of them have demons. I think Justin Curtis doesn't. Uh, 2,000 Suns, again, if, if you're taking chaos, you probably have 1,000 Suns in there, but not everyone does, which surprised me. I think that was... Um, uh, pardon me, I think that was Austin Wingfield who's not taking the Thousand Suns. Um, one Death Guard, almost certainly for Mortarian. Two Chaos Space Marine, probably Disco Lords. Mm -hmm. uh, I mentioned Admech already. There's one Sisters of Battle in there. Uh, that's Ganyo. Uh, I think we can probably safely bet that that's going to be... Uh, his trademark has always been the um, uh, the flying Sisters Ser of Battle. Seraphim. Seraphim, thank you. Uh, the Seraphim, you can pump them up to a 3-up interval, and they're a very effective 3-plus interval and flying screen. So, kind of hard to shoot. You can charge them, but you can't really wrap them. They're just not... And and, and worst case scenario, they're a fast unit with anti-infantry. Yeah. So, they're, they're very useful in that. Like, sometimes they might die just of a high volume, but a 3-up invol with fly is just annoying enough to where you don't want to dedicate what it takes to kill them. Yeah, but if you don't, then they're still there, and that's annoying too. Exactly. Uh, one Chaos Knights, that, that's in Austin Wingfield's list. Uh, three Gene Steer Cult players. All of them are pure. None of them brought Tyrion into guard with that. And then there is one player, uh, Devin Swan, who's bringing Tau. Um, honestly, this is a little more diverse than last year's Nova Invitational. I remember last year, I think it was 32 at the time, but I want to say like 12 people were bringing Imperial Guard with Knights and a Blood Angel detachment. Uh, that was just, that was it last year. That was the list. Mm -hmm. uh, for good reasons. Um, what I'm kind of surprised by is that uh, there are no Imperial Knights and no Orcs. Yeah. Um, other than that, you're missing all of the Skittle Marines. No one's surprised by that because without the Codex, they just don't have anything to stand on, and that's fine. Um, that's why they're getting a Codex. Mm -hmm. uh, no Tyranids doesn't really surprise me. Again, um, if you're bringing Tyranids, you probably are just bringing Jeans to their cult and doing the same thing better. Yeah. Um, so I'm not surprised by much of that. Uh, Orcs surprised me a little bit. Um, but then I, I guess what, Pamperine or Nick Rose would be the people who I'd expect, and... Uh, for whatever reason, they're not here. I don't know if they're going to the tournament or not. Um, and then only one Tau list. Uh, you know, I, Richard Seeger couldn't go to Nova, I know. He would be the one I would think of in addition to Devin Swan. And then a lot of the good Tau players are also on the West Coast. Um, so a lot of them don't come over for Nova. This is definitely an East Coast-centric event just because of traveling. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe perception as well. But um, I think it's a pretty good snapshot of what you see in the, the Northeast meta. So one thing I would say why I'm not surprised by the lack of orcs is when you're playing against consistently good players, they will exploit any time that the orc list falters, because it will falter. So ideally you've done enough to get through that, but a KG player like Jim Vessel, he could lose all his play bearers in the first turn and somehow he's going to win the game. Like he's got the ability to make those decisions and, and capitalize as soon as your opponent shows an opening, and orcs will give openings. Where some some lists, if they're piloted by a skillful player, your window to take advantage of, of a mistake is very small because they can mitigate most of those problems. Orcs just, they're not consistent enough to really play tight against opponents who will take advantage of every minor issue or minor mistake that you make. Yeah, I definitely get that. Um, I think, yeah, I guess the, the short way to say that would be that 
orcs, if something goes wrong, they can't take the counterpunch as well, and orcs have a lot of things that probably happen, but, you know, that may be 60%. Like, you may have the same turn where the shock attack gun doesn't go off and you fail your 8-inch rerollable charge. That could be disastrous at this level, yeah. where every player in this bracket um, is probably good enough to take advantage of that fact and end the game right there. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, and also, I think looking at these this list, none of them are really traditional orc players. Uh, maybe... Nick, not body, but he's been on Genius Circle for a couple months now, so not a shock at all to see him stay on that right after his ETC victory. Um, other than that, I mean, the seeding they did is interesting. Um, I'm sure some people have looked at this and thought, why isn't Jim Vessel number one? Um, I know the crew that puts together the bracket, they look a lot into, they look into like what you've done at Nova as well. They look at not just the current season, but your past body of work, uh, which is actually why I didn't expect to do well or to be ranked highly in this because I've never been to Nova. Um, so Tony Kopak hasn't been active much this season. He's done well when he's played. He just, I'm guessing he's been busy with life. Um, he's number one because he won the Invitational last year. I think that, that pretty much auto gets you to number one of the next Invitational. Mm -hmm. Um, Jim Vessel came in at number four. Um, putting Ganyo and Nick Nanavati ahead of him, it, that's not insulting at all. I mean, yeah. Ganyo won the Open last year, so that gives him a great spot. Nick is, uh, blow him in the rankings at the moment, but he was... Top five in the ITC last year. Um, he was he won LVO. Like, he won that LVO. Two, he, uh, that was two years ago. Yeah. But, but um, but that shows a pattern of yeah. skilled play. So, yeah, yeah. Over the past three seasons, he yeah. was number one, number three, and I think he's number five or six right now. So he's been close enough at the top that I don't mind putting him up there. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, um, Chris Blackham's at number eleven. I thought that was a little low. Um, he's higher ranked in the ITC than I am. Uh, he did very well at Adepticon, so he's got those big event showings in non-ITC format. I'm a little surprised by that personally, but maybe, I don't know if they affect your army in. Um, he's playing Gene Circle, where he's traditionally been an Eldar player. Uh, I don't know how that tradition, that transition is going for him now, uh, if it's going well or not, because they are very different play styles. Mm -hmm. But eh, I'm surprised to see that. Um, and then just a couple um, good matchups that I kind of see. Um, I, I, I unfortunately won't be able to watch this game because I'll be busy. I think Matt Shuckman versus Chris Black is going to be really good. Um, Shuckman's play is, is going to be playing Eldar and Dark Eldar. Uh, at ATC, he ran a Seer Council list. I, I don't know if he's going to continue with that. But I think it's interesting because Eldar is typically not a great match for Gene Storical. But Chris Blackham very intimately understands what that Eldar army does. It's what he's been playing for a while. And then Will... Matt keep up with the Seer Council, a melee unit traditionally, um, or a very short range firepower unit, going into Gene Stealer Cult, a very good melee army, when he could just break out nine flyers and see if he can outlast them. Mm -hmm. um, so we know everyone's factions, but they can still change their list. So I think it's kind of fun that you've got, you know, one of the 16 best players going to the event who is now looking directly at you and thinking, what is he doing? So I know. Alex Fennell is thinking, okay, what is John Lennon doing? Because I'm sure thinking that about him, like, what is he going to be doing? Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to be thinking about that a lot for the next two weeks. That's one of the things I actually kind of like if, like, switching your army, assuming you're practiced with another army, mm -hmm. is if you have Gene Slayer Cult, they're going to say, okay, I'm fighting Twisted Helix. I know I'm going to deal yep. with Aberrants. I got some Hand Flammer dudes. Like, you know what you're dealing with. <laughs> yeah. If, if I see, like, Jim Vessel and he puts down Necrons, I'm going to be like, okay, what does he know that I don't? Yeah. Because <laughs> what the heck am I supposed to do? What what list is he going to play? What's he going to do? Um, so I I kind of like uh, making the change for this. Plus, it's the Invitational. It's not the GT. So it's 95% bragging rights. No, oh, this is all... There might be a prize at the end. I don't yeah. actually know. That's why I left 5%. All bragging maybe, right. maybe there's a prize. It's all about bragging rights. I don't rights. care. I just I want to win it. So, so to me, it would be worth making that risk or taking that risk to throw off the other opponents because they're skilled enough if they know what you're going to do they can play that game in their head they can figure out what to do and and have a million game plans going into it that's how i feel every time i have to fight lennon he knows what i'm going to do better than i do and it sucks <laughs> so played thousands of generations in the making though. oh yes all the generations every generation i am always planning so to just throw a curveball like that like I, I enjoy it i think it'll make it interesting um yeah, actually, honestly, the, the big reason I, I did it, why I'm doing Custodes instead of Gene Circle, is because of BAO. Um, BAO, I showed up early, played the Thursday RTT before the main event, 
played Jim Vessel on top table with my BA army, and quite frankly, I don't think he'll mind me saying this, I beat the pants off of him. I beat him very decisively. He, We didn't play out turns five and six because the game was over. Yeah. And then we played again, and Jim had seen what I had done. And yeah. then Jim won, and I was very sad. And I yeah. think that if we don't play that Thursday game with me showing him my exact list and how I operated it, at the best of my ability, I don't think he gets. I don't think he gets me the first time, but he's a good enough player to see what I was doing, adapt to it the second time. Um, I'm expecting that a lot of these players are going to be players who are going to be doing well in the open. Mm-hmm. It would make sense. I'm hopefully going to do well at the open. I'm really going to try to get into that top bracket there. And at that point, if I'm playing against someone who has just seen me run my list and knows exactly what my plan A is against them, um, I may not know what to change because I haven't seen their new plan. Yep. So I don't know how to best change what I'm doing, and they know how to change what they're doing. These are good enough players that if I show my hand for the Open, because I'd, I'd, I'd rather do well at the Open as much as the Invitational is you know, an honor and looks very, very fun. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't want to show my hand too early, beat Nick Nanavati in the Invitational before I lose to someone else, and then Nick plays me in in, in the o- yeah. in the open, <laughs> and he stops five me. In the open, he stops you because he knows exactly Cause he knows what, what I'm doing, and then I yep. lose. Um, so that that's kind of my thought process. Um, that and the fatigue issue because uh, four days in a row, uh, Gene Circle is hard to play. It's a lot of models. You got to play fast. Nova oh, doesn't man. have chess clocks to start, so I have to be very self conscious about how much time I'm taking because I need all six turns as a Gene Circle player. Yep. The other thing too is just. Um, they're mentally exhausting. Yeah, not not just couldn't. the physical moving 150 models, being bent over the table, rolling mm-hmm. a ton of dice. They're mentally exhausting because you have more units. You have to be constantly aware of where they are, what they're doing, um, what the threat level is. Am I going to lose this unit? Is it worth losing this unit? So there's so many decisions you're making. And that the more decisions you make, the more mentally exhausted you are. And... If your opponent can put you in decision into positions to make difficult decisions when you're tired, it's more likely you're going to make a mistake and they can capitalize. Yep, so it's not necessarily for days one and two. It's really into day three. You're playing against better opponents if you're doing well. Mm-hmm. You're more exhausted. You're playing off of practice instead of off of truly uh, the current board state and stuff like that. You fall into tendencies and your opponents can take advantage of those tendencies. Yeah. So. And all of my tendencies are built around ITC missions, not Nova missions, so I think I think I can play the Nova missions, I've gotten a couple practice games in, but I think I just have to be a little more cognizant of what I'm doing in the Nova games. I can't rely on my old habits, because they may be the wrong decision. Absolutely. So I think I think this was the right call. Um, I definitely... I'm, I'm also excited to play New Army, um, but it's so many less units. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, you've got your three Claydius, you got a couple buff characters... Um, you know, you've got maybe like the big Forge World Terminator squad to go sit inside of the L and say, hi, are you going to come mess with us? Mm-hmm. No? Well, the Claytis will keep shooting. Yeah. And um, like, shield captains on, on jet bikes, like, they're yeah. quick and they're good for Nova missions. Yes. Um, that I do like. Um, I like that a lot. And you drop Terminators in front and say, kill this, you're not killing my shield captain. <laughs> but if you get to the shield captains, three up in ball, like, whatever. Yeah, no, I definitely, <laughs> I like a lot of the options custodians have for Nova missions, because... Yeah. They've got that durability to hold the objective, so we'll, yeah. we'll see what happens. It'll be very fun, I think. Absolutely. I look forward to it. All right. Well, look forward to hearing about it. I won't be there. Uh, ooh, fingers crossed. Uh, maybe I'll be on stream. I don't know. Uh, <sighs> I hope so. They, they, do, they are using the GW stream for the event, so... No cussing. No no <laughs> cussing. Well, I don't think they actually... They, they don't, they don't mic players up because yeah. play, players are too unpredictable Yeah. because of the emotion of the game and just general talking. I get it, but... So. Hopefully I'll be able to appear on stream. That would honestly be that'd be awesome. That would really be a cool scenario because I've never done it for the GW stream before. So yeah. we can hope. But um, other than that, I think that wraps up uh, most of my thoughts on the Invitational. Um, it'll be really really fun. Um, I know a lot of the players here. It'll be good to go see them, hang out with them for an extra day. Uh, there's a couple I don't know that I'm really looking forward to meeting, uh, like Alex Fennel. Um, and I think that's all I got. Uh, anything else from you guys? Um, I don't know what we're going to be talking about next week, actually. Probably oh. Tyranids. I probably Tyranids, yeah. We yeah. can probably talk about Definitely Tyranids next week. Definitely talk about Tyranids next week. Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, I'm going to just beg and plead that Games Workshop gives us Chaos Orcs because I want to play both armies. So just, like, <laughs> make them one army so I can do it. Man, <laughs> no. what if they brought back allies? 
no. Bat- no. Brothers and all of that. I would no. cry. No. <laughs> I don't want to fight Taudar ever again. Uh, <laughs> then I'll just have Caladius with my Gene Circle, and y'all can't beat me. Well, I feel like Imperium would not join okay. up with Xenos. Except that he had an Imperial Knight with his Tyranids in, like, yeah. 6th edition ATC? In 6th edition, well, I ran. Need, there needs to be rules. Let's, let's <laughs> there, there are there rules. Are it's, rules. It's called keywords. <laughs> That's why we have keywords. Uh, no. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, I think that's all we've got for now, so uh, tune in next week. Uh, this one should be on iTunes, I'm thinking. So yeah. we are listening to your feedback, so please, please give us more. Uh, comment, like, subscribe. We have a YouTube page. Uh, thank you for listening. Yeah, and uh, we will talk to you all next week. Bye.